Okay, so if we're really focusing on just removing particular species or individual plant species from these communities, we're really just focusing on this symptom. And yes, I, I know that like some of these plant communities are more susceptible to the invasion of some of these plants and, and maybe they're, they're very robust and resilient plant communities and some plants can get them. But more often than not, there's something going on there that's creating that open niche for um, these invasive species to come in. Um, and if you think about the tools that we use like herbicide, they in, in and of themselves are a disturbance in that plant community. So we're creating disturbance um, and if we go back to this definition of invasive species, these are species that are successful in colonizing disturbed sites and they can maintain their abundance under conditions of repeated disturbance. So we're basically setting ourselves up um, into a perfect scenario for these species to be successful and be successful over the long term. We're just kind of like playing their game um, if we're focused on just that traditional approach of killing the species, trying to remove an individual plant species from a community. So how can we take a step back um, and look at the broader community? I think one of the things that we do when we go out to talk to landowners or when we're working with uh, an agency within, within Missoula County is really starting with the use of the land. What, what is your goal for the property that you're managing? What do you wanna see on the ground? And we also know what the current vegetation and condition is. We can, we can look and see what's happening there. And we can also have a discussion about the desired vegetation that we need in that plant community to meet the use of the land. Um, and whether or not that's for aesthetic purposes or um, open spaces for uh, species diversity, we, we still know what those three are. And what we can really focus our tools on is this idea of plant succession, not using our tools to just remove a species, but using those tools to push the plant community towards the desired plant community that we want and making sure that it's still, um, um, it's more appropriately meeting the use of the land. Um, and this, this is a cycle because as we, as we introduce those disturbances, we may not know all the answers of what that's gonna do to the plant community. And we can, we can adapt our approach as we continue to work through this cycle. And so if you just kind of want to lay that out and think about all these tools that you've tried to use to remove a species, start thinking about those tools as a way to influence plant succession into the desired vegetation that you want um, that will meet the, the uses that you have planned for your land. So, um, you know, whether or not it's irrigation, cultivation, grazing, herbicides, um, biocontrol, mowing, all of those things are going to be more effective at influencing plant succession than they are, gonna, they are gonna be at removing an individual species. And when I talk about plant succession and when you really dive into this idea of EBIPM, the three things that you can influence in a plant community are site availability, species availability, and species performance. And what do I mean by that? So site availability, um, that's happy little places for happy little seeds is, is what I, used to say with uh, Native ideas, if you're gonna, if you wanna grow something on a piece of land, there's gotta be space for that thing to grow. And so what tools can you use to influence that community in a way that allows for happy little places, for happy little seeds to establish and, and grow and, and begin to um, provide additional seed into that space. Um, species availability, have this conversation a lot especially with folks um, after burns. Uh, you know, you, you see a lot of information that comes out after a fire of uh, the ability for invasive species to come into that space. And the first conversation that I have with those individuals is what was growing there before? Um, because uh, an invasive species isn't going to magically show up on your property if it wasn't there beforehand. It, it really has, it really comes down to what species are there when you have that disturbance and what species are gonna be there um, to take advantage of those, of those disturbances. Um, and so a lot of our tools that we think about, um, um, when we think about traditional weed control, they are really gonna in influence the species availability. Um, but you also have to be very considerate of the, um, 
the non-specificity of a lot of our tools to, to impact the species availability of the species that you want, the beneficial species that might already be there. And third, species performance. Um, I've, I've had very interesting conversations with folks that have, have moved to Western Montana who love Bitterroot and they love their horses and they, they want to have a horse pasture full of Bitterroot. Um, and it just doesn't work out that, that way, unfortunately. Um, so you really have to be considerate, especially when you're thinking about those land use goals and how you wanna use your land that you're thinking about species that are appropriate to that use. Um, and, you know, and that's where you can really dive into a lot of detail of whether or not the soils are appropriate, the water availability, the slope, the aspect, all of these things that can influence the performance of the species that you want, as well as the species that you don't want there. For us, we also have to take that and consider um, the reality of resources that we have available to us to assist landowners. And to a certain extent, as a manager, you have to think about the resources that you have available to you to effectively manage these communities. Um, and so it's important to think about where these invasive species are um, on this invasion curve as it relates to the property that you're managing or the land or the community that you're managing. Um, and this, this is a, just a general invasion curve that shows um, the, the economic return of your investment on treatment or on the treatment actions that you're doing as you look at this invasion. So just as a, a brief description, this is the area occupied by the species and then the, as, it, uh, as its population expands over time. And so, if the species in here, a lot of our programs within the Department of Ecology and Extension are focused on education, prevention. Uh, we run the Clearwater Inspection Stations, whose entire goal is to make sure that a species doesn't come in and we don't have to deal um, with it once it's established. And generally speaking, the return on your investment for prevention actions is uh, 100, like for every dollar that you spend, you're saving $100 that you would have to spend in management. Um, we also have early detection and rapid response programs um, that once we have the species um, show up on the scene, we have small enough numbers of localized populations. You know, we're not so much, that's, that is the only space where you can really be thinking about that traditional approach to invasive species management. We do want to go out and we want to eradicate them because we potentially could. And if we can prevent their establishment, then um, we have a return of $20. $25 for every dollar spent. Containment um, is um, a little bit farther up um, that invasion curve. We know we have established populations. We're past our ability to eradicate that population, but we can still prevent it from spreading from those isolated pockets to other parts of the county or other parts of, um, of Western Montana even. And again, we still have a little bit better return than over here, but we're down to for every dollar, we're, we're basically saving five to ten dollars. Um, I should have added to this invasion curve, and on most of these invasion curves, when they're focused on um, educating the public, there's usually a dot right about here um, that says this is where the public notices that there's a weed. <laughs> um, so it's very difficult you know, to you know, focus and educate the public until they really start seeing it out on the landscape. And unfortunately, by the time you're seeing it on the landscape, our ability to eradicate that species is pretty much um, out the window. And unfortunately, the traditional approach to invasive species management has set this expectation that we can eradicate um, noxious weeds and remove them from these plant communities and Unfortunately, by the time we're having that conversation with the public, um, that's not feasible. And then, then we're not meeting people's expectations. Um, so again, if we're just thinking about the traditional approach, we're never really gonna be successful in meeting the goals that people are setting in the community. Um, uh, so I hate to uh, hurt anybody's feelings or like, I wanna let you down easy. Napweed's here to stay. We are 
far beyond the, the moment when we could eradicate that um, But that's where we start talking about asset-based protection and start managing for thresholds. And I'm gonna talk about biocontrol as an example here in a little bit. But biocontrol is an excellent example of how we start to manage for thresholds and to mitigate damage rather than try to focus on eradication. Um, so yes, our, our goal at the, at, the, at the Department of Ecology and Extension is not to eradicate all invasive species from Western Montana. It is to mitigate the economic and environmental impact of these species. And to do that, um, we have this new definition of management or the, man, the definition of management, I guess, that, that I uh, fall back on the most. And that is, we are gonna spend the time to go through a process to have the correct identification of an invasive species, to recognize its biological and environmental needs, uh, to assess its damage, inner injury, or nuisance to agriculture industry or the public at large. And we're gonna do that before we select and implement uh, any tool, whether that's an integrated set of tools or an individual tool. Um, and the goals of that may change depending on where that species is on that invasion curve. Um, to either prevent it from occurring, to suppress the damage. Um, and then we're also gonna go through the work to evaluate the efficacy of those tools um, so we can adapt and do better uh, in the future. Okay, so are there any questions on EBIPM or whether or not you should just spray your nap leaves? Let's go back to the definition. So it's a non-native plant and it's successful in colonizing disturbed but potentially productive sites. So I wouldn't say that, I think the, the definition of disturbance isn't just acute disturbance. I think once there has been that disturbance, I think it can hold its own. Once that niche space has been opened up, I think there are different um, resource needs for knapweed and we, we even see uh, drought impact the population of knapweed um, through time. So um, I don't think the disturbance necessarily just has to be us. It could be drought stress, it could be any other thing. Napweed is is here to stay, and I think it does, um, you know, move around the landscape more easily through disturbance. If you do have a really resilient plant community, um, napweed does tend to fall out of those. But yeah. Um, I would talk about fire as a management tool in this regard. Um, it, I do get a lot of questions about whether or not fire will help um, get rid of cheatgrass. Um, and I think that the answer is no. Uh, it, for the, for cheatgrass in particular, um, it's kind of um, evolved with fire and in the Great Basin, you've seen it change fire regimes and the frequency of fire uh, over time to actually um, benefit cheatgrass propagation. Um, and in just even a smaller scenario, if you have cheatgrass here locally, you never get a fire hot enough to kill the seed. You essentially clear all the duff layer off, the seed falls onto the soil, and then you get this nice little nitrogen spike from uh, the burning of that vegetation. So it does, uh, you know, depending on the plant community that you're managing, though, it can Im improve site availability and it can improve, improve species performance, but maybe not always for the species that you want to improve performance for. Oops. Any other questions? And this. I was really excited to find this whitish gentian patch uh, in the Crazy Mountains. Uh, this is like on the little ridge line up to Crazy Peak, and there was all these whitish gentians. Okay, 
So I wanted to shift then to into um, a number of examples of programs that we have implemented within Missoula County that kind of take this uh, definition of invasives and this definition of management and put it out on the ground. The first example I wanted to talk about was the Missoula County Aquatic Invasive Species District. And I want to acknowledge uh, Chris Mascari, who is our AIS uh, coordinator with Missoula County. Um, he has been the lead for the majority of the work that I'm gonna talk about here in the next couple of slides. So why do we have an AIS district? Um, the first reason is that we have amazing resources to protect in Western Montana, aquatic resources to protect in Montana. And those resources are recognized across North America. This is a spider map of the boats that came through um, Clearwater Junction in 2020. So we had over 37,000 uh, watercraft come through um, Clearwater Junction through the summer of 2020. Um, and they came from all over the country um, just to recreate in the waters within Missoula County. Um, so people know that these resources are here. People want to come enjoy these resources and we wanna make sure that we can protect them in the long term, not only for those folks that wanna visit, but for the people that live here as well. Um, through the work that we had done with FWP starting in 2016, managing the Clearwater Station and even earlier than that, starting in 2007, when we started monitoring uh, for um, uh, aquatic macrophytes um, in 2007, um, we'd started to build strong relationships with uh, Lakeshore HOAs, with watershed groups like the Clearwater uh, Resource Council, Swan Valley Connections, Lola Watershed Group, Clark Fork uh, Coalition, Blackfoot Challenge, a lot of people working on uh, protecting our water resources. And we were stepping into a very um, narrow niche around invasive species that wasn't really being focused on. Um, and that resulted in really good, strong relationships with those folks. Um, we also needed to formalize the work that, that we were doing. Um, we have authority, like I said, um, in the beginning of the presentation to list aquatic invasive plants. Um, that does rest at, at the local level, but a lot of aquatic invasive species are in different taxa and that authority rests at a state agency. So, we were a little bit outside of our bounds at that time, and, we, and the commissioners recognized that we needed some, some legal backing and some, um, some work to formalize and protect the work that, and the partnerships that we had. And with creating an AIS district, we also had the opportunity um, to increase the resources at a local level for AIS prevention. So we have more flexibility sometimes than our state agencies or our federal, federal agency partners. And we are able to pursue dollars and build partnerships that they might not necessarily be able to, to accomplish. Uh, we also found this very interesting, uh, nice little piece of legislation that allowed us to create it. So when mussels were discovered in 2016, way over at Tiber Reservoir on the Marias River, um, there was concern that it's just a hop, skip and a jump to come over into the Columbia River Basin and potentially into Flathead Lake, which isn't even larger economic driver and another aquatic resource that is even more discovered than our resources. So they, they uh, created the, this little statute that uh, allowed counties located within the Columbia River Basin to adopt ordinances and resolutions regarding the prevention or control of invasive species. Um, and so the commissioner saw that and saw the opportunity and worked with us to pass a resolution in 2020 with um, Establishing the Missoula County Aquatic Invasive Species District um, with the main objectives of creating an invasive species strategic plan, the budget necessary to execute that plan, and a list of priority invasive species for Missoula County and for Western Montana. Um, I'm not going to go through that full plan, but the four main primary outcomes that that district worked with our state and federal agency partners to develop was that we, one, wanted to increase public knowledge and engagement in aquatic invasive species issues in Western Montana. Uh, it's a whole other world out there under the water. 
Um, we wanted to prevent the establishment of new aquatic invasive species populations. We wanted to contain and reduce uh, existing populations of aquatic invasive species in Missoula County. And really most importantly, we needed to increase coordination among AIS agencies working in Missoula County. And as I said, the majority of authority, um, um, the majority of authority for aquatic invasive species rests at the state level, but as a weed district or as a partner with the weed district and overlaid with the weed district, we had the authority to take the leadership on aquatic invasive plants. And up until re very recently, that has been a world that most agencies and managers have avoided. Um, there's not a lot of clear direction on the management of aquatic plants, and there's not a lot of comfort with trying to manage um, species in public waters um, with the tools that we typically use for the management of plants. And the example that I really wanted to talk about with the aquatic invasive species is this beautiful invasive. Um, does anybody know what this species is? No. Oh, thanks, Mary Rose. Uh, so this is fragrant water lily. And this is on Black Lake um, last year. So if you're not familiar with the Clearwater chain of lakes, you have Sealy, Salmon, and then this nice little lake called Black Lake right down below that. And I would say probably three quarters of that water body um, at peak, peak, um, peak flower is covered with fragrant water lily. And to give you a little bit of background on fragrant water lily, um, it is native to North America, mostly in New England. And there has been, there's a little bit of confusion about that because it was moved so extensively in the 1800s as a very popular addition to water gardens. This is actually one example of North America exporting a plant into Europe to be in every water garden of, of every rich person. Um, and then they traded and shared and then brought them back to the US um, as, as an ornamental. The first recorded um, uh, population of a fragrant water lily in Montana is actually on, on Salmon Lake. And it was um, collected in 1935. And if you know where Legendary Lodge is on Salmon Lake, that was once Mowitza Lodge that was built by um, one of the Copper King families. Mm -hmm. And probably around the 1890s, as far as we could tell in our, in our work, um, someone within that family loved this plant um, and wanted it at their lodge on Salmon Lake. And I haven't found the paintings yet, but for some reason, this individual also wanted a lily incorporated into every painting that was made of her. Um, so I'm still trying to find those for the presentations. Um, but because it's so beautiful and because it does so well in this system, and because we have all these cabin and house and holdings along that chain of lake, we've seen rapid expansion along the Clearwater chain. Um, anywhere where there are cabins in that area, we have found small populations. Um, or large populations um, of fragrant water lily, including uh, around 72 acres of Sealy Lake being infested with, with, um, with fragrant water lily. So instead of going out there after we, so I will say too that we, our focus on this species has come about a lot from citizen engagement and citizen concern of the expansion of this species. And we heard a lot of incidental information about how oh, five years ago we didn't have this plant, now we have it. Um, we didn't want to take that on face value necessarily and just go out and start treating the species. And so this is a list of the work that we've done um, in order to inform any management action that is about to occur. And in 2019, that meant that we went out um, and mapped the extent of fragrant water really within that system. We also worked um, to develop the best herbicide um, efficacy for the work that we wanted to do, not only on the control of the plant species that we were targeting, but how could we limit the impact to native vegetation and actually set the system up in order for native vegetation to start recurring. We also wanted to quantify the changes of native plant communities as a result of fragrant water lily. Uh, we were taking a snapshot in time 
of a species that has been in this system since 1935. So how do we know what has happened in that system as a result of fragrant water lily versus other things in that system that may have potentially allowed fragrant water lily to do what it's doing? Is it, is it truly that fragrant water lily is the invasive or are there other conditions in there that are making, um, making the system look like it does and that fragrant water lily just happens to be taking advantage of? Um, we also wanted to assess the long-term impacts of fragrant water lily on the water quality, water quality uh, of the chain of lake system. We have a ton of biomass now in this system. As it breaks down at the end of the year, is it basically depleting dissolved oxygen? Is that having impacts on other species within those systems? Um, is, it, is it actually increasing the biomass compared to the, the native plant communities in there? And are we actually seeing a transition from our native water lily or the yellow pond lily to this, or is it just taking advantage of new niche space within that system? Uh, we also wanted to get at the question of the, the genetic lineage of the populations that we have in the Pacific Northwest. There's anecdotal evidence that there has been one influx of this species based on a big garden show that happened in the Seattle area in 1890s. Um, and that's how we got all of these infestations around the Pacific Northwest, um, but we didn't know that. And since it is um, native to North America, we wanted to know if there is a natural extent at which um, it persists. There's also um, a very similar native that we have in Montana. Um, Bergi, I think, is the, the species. And then there's a native closer to the Mexican border. So we wanted to make sure that we were, we knew the species that we were dealing with and the extent of its population. Um, and we want to develop restoration strategies. Are there ways that we can effectively utilize a lot of the information that the horticulture industry has developed for water gardens, especially for our native new fire species, and be able to quickly rehabilitate these sites if we do go out and control. And I will say, um, one of the interesting things that we found, especially with our um, herbicide effic efficacy trial, is that we, we set up a number of plots in Salmon, uh, Blanchard, and Black Lake to determine the best herbicide to treat. And as part of that, we set up um, uh, water survey or water monitoring sites above, in, and below to see the life of those herbicides in those sites. And what we found more than anything else were herbicides that we weren't putting in the system. Um, there are a significant number of herbicides and a high level of phosphorus coming from runoff from all of the development in that area. Um, so, you know, trying to figure out what we would do most, we've actually learned more about the system at large and helped other people around uh, on the shoreline are impacting that, that site. We have yet to do um, a full-on management treatment for a fragrant water lily, but one is planned um, for 2024. And right now our current work is focused on partnering with Forest Service and uh, other than I should say these, these small early detection rapid response treatments on very small populations in Lindbergh and Hidden Lake. Um, but we're working with uh, the Flathead, the Lolo, and Fish, Wildlife, and Parks to determine, determine and follow through with all the permitting requirements that we need to work in, in those uh, water bodies. Uh, what survey needs, working with the uh, Montana Heritage Program to develop uh, both the survey needs that we need for the and endangered species, as well as the delimiting the population of fragrant water lily, and still working with Army Corps for the selection of the best management tools and what we need for pre and post action monitoring. Um, and most importantly, how do we communicate all this information to the public, both um, that are utilizing those sites, but also just live in the area. So we are still looking back at that management in the determining the best, the best route phase, but we're learning a significant amount about the system. All right, any questions about aquatics? Yeah. 
I'm not positive about the exact location that you're talking about, but um, we have significant populations in the Clearwater Chain of Lakes. You get up in the Noxon area, you also see significant populations. And then as you go into Idaho um, at Lake Ponderé there, you have large populations as well. Yeah, they do regrow, um, but we are, as part of that tabletop exercise around Holland Lake that was on that last slide, our, our approach will most likely be um, more integrated than just herbicide applications. Um, there will be sites um, within that that we do hand pulling. The Forest Service has attempted hand pulling for the last, I think, seven years in a row. Um, they've reduced the population somewhat, but it, it grows at a depth that you can't really get down and effectively remove it. Um, so we'll, we'll have a mixed approach to that. And you can also spread it from broken forms once you do the transplant. Wow. Yeah. There has been some interested interest in the development of those macrophyte harvesters, especially on Placid and Salmon Lake. Um, the biggest concern, honestly, from um, lakeshore homeowners is access to their docks and then access to the lake. And so they're not so much concerned about the ecological impact of this new species in the water body, but it's impacting the recreational access to the water. Um, we, we have been coordinating with a couple of those folks that are interested in developing that to ensure that if that does happen, those harvesters wouldn't be moved from water body to water body. Um, you know, there's a significant amount of biomass on there. And for fragrant water lay in particular, it only really takes you know one to two inches of, of the root to, to reestablish and, and grow. So is there another? These pictures are uh, in the missions above Island Lake. Um, and I caught it in a perfect bloom. If you go over that little pass, um, McDonald Peak is there, and I think it's like Iceberg Lake, but it's gorgeous. Okay, second program uh, example that I wanted to cover um, is the Montana Biocontrol Project, which is a statewide coordination project for the use of bio, classical biological control. Um, and I wanna acknowledge Melissa Maggio, who is the Montana Biocontrol Coordinator uh, through our office. Um, and if you have any questions on aquatics, Chris is actually um, the person I will put you in touch with and Melissa for biocontrol work. Okay, so just a little bit of background on this statewide project that's housed um, through our office. Uh, the Montana Biocontrol Coordination Project is completely soft funded and it's a grassroots effort that was initiated in 2013 by virtually every land management partner that you can think of in Montana. We had uh, federal, state, county, nonprofit organizations, private landowners, uh, tribal is not mentioned in, in this little um, paragraph, but a number of tribal partners that have also participated. And what they saw was a need for increased coordination uh, within the state for biocontrol. Uh, biocontrol has existed in the state of Montana for like a good number of years. And what we had seen is that there had been a lot of insects um, distributed and not a lot of work to figure out what the efficacy was of those insects out of the ground and how we could effectively utilize this resource by monitoring and making sure that we, we understood how they were being integrated into these systems. Uh, the current focus of the Montana Biocontrol Program is on one, insect collection and distribution. Uh, we have certain sites, especially in Western Montana, that have very abundant populations and they're very effective systems. And so we try to collect from those sites and move them to areas where we have abundant weed populations, but not necessarily the biocontrol uh, insects in those sites. Um, to do that, uh, we work with a variety of land managers throughout Montana 
host a lot of collection days, ship a lot of insects, not only into Montana, but uh, a number of states across the country. Uh, we also focus a lot of work on education. Um, that means workshops, presentations, uh, the development of educational materials, um, working with our overseas research partners to make sure that the partners here understand uh, progress that we're making in foreign exploration for additional agents to be uh, approved and introduced. And I think most importantly uh, is monitoring. Um, like I said, there's a lot of insects that have been moved around and we've done, I think, a fairly poor job of actually monitoring um, the efficacy of these insects out on the landscape. Um, and that also helps us identify additional research needs. Um, I don't know, I go into that a lot more, but we're, we're learning a lot of these, about these systems as we start to dive into how these insects are actually um, interacting in these plant communities. Um, but I wanted to take a step back and uh, just cover the definition of classical biocontrol, because you, you, know, you have a lot of conversations about bugs that eat weeds, sheep, sheep that eat weeds are those biocontrol. And in the sense of this program, uh, and in the sense of classical biocontrol, sheep are not uh, a biological control. Classical biocontrol is the deliberate release of a specialized natural enemy from the weed's native range that reduces the weed's abundance or spread in its introduced range. Um, there are a number of instances where people have looked at uh, generalist insect feeders from North America that are feeding on Eurasian water milfoil or another plant species. Um, that, that does not fit into the category of classical biocontrol. These are species that have evolved um, with these target plants and are very host specific. And what do I mean by host specific? Host specific. Um, so one of the big um, efforts that has to be undertaken in order for an insect to be approved for classical biocontrol release in North America is that they have to undergo um, a lot of host specificity testing. Um, and there's a couple definitions here um, uh, that I think are important to that. So one, um, there's a fundamental host range and that is the list of plants on which an herbivore insect can complete its life cycle. Uh, the second is the ecological host range, which is a list of plant species which an herbivore can complete its life cycle under natural conditions. There's host range expansion, which is a new plant species added to the diet of one of these insects once it's introduced into the field. And then there's host shift, which is uh, an actual shift of that insect to the preference or performance of another, another plant or another host plant. And so as these insects are being identified overseas, they are placed in these no choice tests where they are in a terrarium with a target or with a potential target plant species in the native range, or maybe it's a, an important crop um, species. And essentially the insect can eat it, fulfill its life cycle, or it can die. And um, if it feeds or can finish its life cycle on that species, then it, it is taken out of testing and it's no longer considered a biocontrol agent. Um, all insects that are approved now to come into the United States have to pass this fundamental host range where they can only finish their life cycle for the most part on um, the target weed. Um, we do have a number of instances where you see um, what you can, would consider spillover effect where um, the, target, the target weed is in close proximity to a native species that's potentially in the, the same genus. Um, and once the target weed is gone, maybe there's a little bit of feeding on that as they're like kind of testing it out, but they never finish their, um, never finish their life cycle on that. To date, we have no examples of insects or biocontrol agents that have gone through this process that have um, done a complete host shift. They, all, they have all stayed very true to the target weeds um, that they have been introduced for. And we had that um, invasion curve earlier on in the presentation. I, I like uh, this one more specific to biocontrol because I think it does a really good job of managing the expectations of what we're trying to do as we start to manage some of these um, some of these well-established weed species like spotted knapweed. So what you see 
um, over here as in this wavy, you always see net like just fluctuations in, in the plant species um, throughout the seasons. For napweed in particular, if we have really droughty years, you see the population drop drastically. If we have uh, wet falls and wet springs, you'll see the population increase in, in, you know, through, through those seasons. You see this net of fluctuation. Um, and that's, that's kind of what the, the carry capacity of the plant community allows. Once you have the introduction of the biocontrol agent, you really, you really see this boom and bust cycle. Um, there is no biocontrol agent that we have ever released that has been successful at eradicating the target weed. You see the, the biocontrol agent's population grow as it, as it expands on that weed population. It crashes the weed population. There's nothing to eat. It crashes too. Um, and then what you start to see is a reduction of the plant community density over time. And where our goal is to manage it below the damage threshold or to a, to a threshold that is acceptable within the plant community. I think the best example of this that you can really see in Western Montana is St. John's Wort at the Bison Range. Um, St. John's Wort at the Bison Range used to, um, in the past, completely um, cover those hills with yellow. And as the, uh, the Chrysalina uh, beetles were introduced, you, you saw this occur it, um, almost immediately. The population just exploded. The wheat population crashed. And now, you know, as you, if you do see um, St. John's Ward up there, they're very isolated patches, very dense, but they, they disappear almost you know, over a very few uh, years. Um, so just to kind of give you an idea of the common wheat biocontrol systems that we have in Western Montana, um, that are successful. Uh, we have spotted knapweed with over 12 uh, approved uh, biocontrol agents. Um, the one in particular that I think is most well recognized is the Cyclopeonis weevil, which is about uh, under 10 to eat now. Yellow toad flax uh, is a very successful uh, Cenus weevil, a stem feeder. Uh, Dalmatian toad flax has and you see this species as well with the stem feeder, uh, Chrysalina on St. John's work, and then we have a number of flea beetles and Ovaria, which is a wood beetle um, on the leafy spurge. And this, um, this is an example of one of the education materials that that program has developed. The colors aren't quite coming through. Um, easy to identify these species when they're adults, not so easy to identify or know if they're in your target weeds uh, any other time of the year. So this shows um, the development of the insect or how you would identify the insect over the season. So it goes from spring, summer, fall, spring, summer, fall. So you can have this and look through and identify whether or not you have those species on your, um, on your property. It is, I just didn't bring it. But if you come by our office, we'll give you a bunch. Uh, and one final, um, just going back to the, the importance of monitoring. Um, this is a particular research project um, that the Montana Biocontrol Project has been working on for the last couple of years. Um, so hound's tongue, um, if, if you're not familiar, is a very fun borage species that we have in Western Montana. It has the little burrs that get stuck in your pants, get stuck in your dog's hair. Um, it's not a fun species. And it's very difficult to manage with herbicides because of where it grows. It grows in a lot of riparian areas. It grows where deer or black bears are moving through, dropping seeds in a lot of underbrush. Very difficult to get in and manage that and not uh, negatively impact um, native species. So hound's tongue has a, a root weevil uh, Mogulones that went through all of the testing um, that I was describing earlier and was approved for release in Canada in 1997. Um, however, um, there were a number of four edge species in uh, the Southwest that people were concerned that it would potentially finish its life cycle on. So it was not approved in the US for release. Um, the weevils didn't know that. They started moving uh, south. Um, 
They've done a very effective job at removing hound's tongue uh, within the Canadian provinces of British Columbia and Alberta and Saskatchewan, which were the target populations. And it's now moving into Washington, Idaho, and Montana. And so um, in 2019, the Montana Invasive Species Council held a science advisory panel um, to evaluate the feasibility of actually getting this insect approved uh, for release in the United States. And one of the recommendations um, from that science advisory panel is that we needed to begin some non-targeting, non-target monitoring to see if we were seeing any of those impacts um, around that concern for spillover or potential uh, uh, completion of life cycles on, on some of the non-target species. Um, so they have received funding through the Forest Service Bee Chip Program. Um, they modeled all of their research after uh, post-release research that was conducted in Canada to, because um, we had a very fortunate ability to actually see what the species was doing in the invaded range. Um, and to date, they've identified um, sites within Montana and Washington where we can monitor the insect, the hound's tongue is the target weed, and the non-target borage species oh. all see if they're uh, impacting okay. each other. And hopefully this information will go into APHIS to, um, to help inform their decisions and hopefully get the insect approved for the U.S. So we manage them um, in the field. Um, a lot of the land managers that we work with specifically in Western Montana have um, very robust populations and we work with them to do collections in the field to redistribute to other places. So if you're interested, as an example, as a landowner, you can contact this program. Um, they work with either a youth organization here in Missoula or other youth programs uh, around the state to um, get you releases to them. It depends on the system. Um, there, are, there are some species that we still develop in sectories that are very managed um, to collect off of, but for the most part, we have solid populations in the field that we can just collect directly from. This is a Italian peak and a CF. Oh. Okay, and the last program I wanted to talk about real quickly is a new endeavor that we're starting to focus on um, within Missoula County. Um, and I want to acknowledge Mary Rose Coleman, who is our habitat coordinator. And this is a shift in our program to more, it talks about EBIPM. We're also shifting more into another fun acronym, IPPM, which is Integrated Pest and Pollinator because, um, well, for a number of reasons. One, I think um, walking back to more of that traditional approach to, to invasive species management, um, one of the ways that agencies have typically um, gauged their success on invasive species management is the number of acres sprayed. And um, I, I feel and a number of agencies have struggled with how to have a more effective way of um, gauging the success of invasive species management because the number of gallons of herbicide output or the number of acres sprayed doesn't give you a good picture of what that herbicide has done on the ground or what the community is transitioning into. Pollinators, however, are something that we can really focus on and monitor. It's something that we value out on the landscape. And so as we continue to do invasive species management, especially invasive plant management, pollinators provide a really good opportunity for monitoring to say, is the work that we're doing improving pollinator habitat or is, it something, is there something that we need to change? And so this is a shift for us to more effectively know what the work we are doing um, uh, is accomplishing out on the ground. Two, and this, is, this, this might not be such a good fit for this particular audience, um, but Missoula, in particular has done an amazing job of um, engaging the community and the importance of native plants 
and native plant conservation. Um, but I think for a lot of the people now moving here, even if they're interested in native plant conservation, that native plant conservation and the engagement with native plants is something that they wanna promote um, larger land managers to do. So native plant management and native plant conservation is something that we help the city of Missoula do on city open space, or we help the forest service or DMC and we, we want these native plant communities out there. Pollinators are an interesting shift and something that I think is tangible for an urban population that you know, understands the importance of pollinators. And there are a lot of tangible things that they can do in their backyard, um, regardless of the plants that they're growing um, to improve, um, improve habitat and engage them, not just on what they can do in, in, on, on their little parcel, but also what they can do to start talking to some of these larger land managers. So um, the Missoula County Flower, Flowering Pollinator Lawn Program is just one small step in a larger pollinator conservation and habitat enhancement program that we're, we're starting to dive into with the Department of Ecology and Extension. Um, and I stole some very nice facts and slides from Mary Rose um, for this presentation um, that are just, just nice ways to start thinking about why, why this is an important concept and, and why um, the work that we're doing, even with just this very small flowering pollinator lawn project can be impactful. So just to think about the, the number of species of bees out there, there's 20,000 bee species worldwide, 4,000 in North America. Thanks to work that Mary Rose has done, we know there are over 230 native bee species um, just in Missoula County. And one of the important things to think about is that they're central place foragers. So they have a nest, they move out and forage from that nest and they come home. So they're not, they're not just going all over, they need forage around where they live in order to be in that space. Um, as an urbanizing county in Montana, or I mean, being in Montana, maybe this is something that we don't think about, but we are a quickly urbanizing space. Um, urban and suburban ecosystems are the fastest growing ecosystem in the world. And when we think about urbanization and we think about urban landscapes, more, more often than not, we think about lawns. Um, unfortunately, you know, that, that is the space that gets developed as our green spaces. And it doesn't necessarily have any of those, um, those floral resources or the habitat resources that a lot of these pollinators or bees in particular would need. In addition to that, um, there's a lot of other lame parts about uh, lawns. Mary Rose tries to be really nice when she gives this presentation and not upset lawn people, but it's like, there's so many crazy facts that you can learn um, of lawns as a, a very significant uh, resource sink. Um, there are three times more acres of irrigated lawn than irrigated corn in the United States. Nine billion gallons of water are used each day um, on residential lawn irrigation. There are golf courses in eastern U.S. that use upwards of 170,000 gallons of water a day to keep uh, golf courses green. Um, unfortunately, in those residential areas, 50% of that water is typically not used. It's wasted. Um, 800 million gallons of fuel are burned each year um, to mow lawns. And in that process, we're, we also um, end up spilling 17 million gallons of fuel. Um, there are more uh, pounds of fertilizer, 10 times more pounds of fertilizer um, used to keep our lawns green than there are to fertilize our crops in the United States. And a significant amount of the herbicides and pesticides that we use in this country are not used for invasive plant management. They're used um, to keep dandelions um, out of your lawn. I didn't add this to this slide, but as I was looking through these, um, <laughs> looking through these facts, I also found that there are over, uh, over 74,000 injuries related to lawnmowers each year. <laughs> um, there are 600 children amputations that occur in the United States each year because of lawnmowers that cost upwards of $75 million a year. So I don't know, lawns are just kind of lame. Um, and above all that, we're spending a lot of our time trying to keep these places green for no, no other reason than to keep them green, up to 70 hours per person per year 
on lawns that could be used for something so much more fun. Um, which is why we've started initiating this flower lawn program, which is taking your typical um, turf grass mixes and out adding some floral components to it. Um, it's gonna reduce a, a lot of those inputs that go into um, the management of those other boring lawns. Um, it's gonna take less water, it's gonna take less mowing, um, but you can still use it as a lawn space. It's not gonna be your soccer field. I understand that there are some places that turf still makes sense, um, but there's a lot of places that we're putting turf that it doesn't. Um, and in addition, you know, it's, it's just gonna reduce the use of herbicides or insecticides. And while we're protecting these bees, we're also protecting a lot of other invertebrates and habitat that's um, important for other invertebrates that we rely on. Um, so we've initiated this uh, flowering pollinator lawn as the first step into engaging the community and more of a hands-on approach to making our urban spaces uh, more diversified and uh, uh, more tailored to more than just us. Um, this last year, um, we put out a call for interested citizen scientists and people that wanted to work with us that would um, attend a couple workshops, provide us with information about their lawn um, and about their seeding project and about the success so we can begin to build something that's more specific um, to Western Montana. Uh, we've modeled this after work out of uh, uh, Minnesota, University of Minnesota. Um, and the species that, that worked in Minnesota, we think they, they work here to a certain degree, but we want to we want to know what's happening when people try to implement this um, in, in Missoula and make sure that we can improve the program, um, improve the success of, of these plant communities as, uh, as we move through time here. We're still working on uh, um, our cool messaging, but we think unlocking your pollinator potential is gonna get people engaged. I didn't have any flowers for the uh, tobacco roots, but that's the tobacco roots. That was really brief because I, I feel like I'm running kind of kind of long here. Um, are there any questions on pollinators? Because Mary Rose is right there. I don't even have to send you to anybody else. Okay, finally, just very briefly, I wanted to mention another exciting transition with our department, which is the Gerald Marks Exploration Center in Rocky Mountain Gardens, which is being built on the fairgrounds right now. Um, it will house our department, the Missoula Conservation District and the Missoula Butterfly House and Insectarium. They'll have their tropical butterfly house, uh, 2000 square feet of insectarium exhibit space, We'll have a large conference room, which maybe we can invite the Native Plant Society to, to host their um, meetings at. Um, and we'll have two and a half acres of demonstration gardens on this space as well that will, um, this is just kind of a brief map. Uh, our, our basic goal, basic, our goal with, with these teaching gardens, the Rocky Mountain Gardens, is we don't care what you wanna grow on your property. Um, we want to make sure that you can do it successfully and show you how to do it in this space. So whether you want to grow an orchard, you want to grow berries, you want to grow veggies, you want a forest garden, you want native plants, um, you want your pollinator lawn, you want just a drought uh, tolerant uh, lawn, you want a traditional ornamental garden, you want cut flowers, you want to focus on pollinators. We want to show you how to do that and we want to show you how to do that in a way that considers the conditions and the, um, the, the water that we have available in the West. Um, so we're excited for this garden. Um, we'll be beginning installation through this year. So if you're interested in volunteering opportunities, um, this is a space um, that we'll be happy to have you. Um, but I think that's it. Could you please discuss the county's approach to control of leafy spurge? Sorry, that was probably meant for a long time ago. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the county's approach to leafy spurge. Um, leafy spurge falls in a category of well-established species within Missoula County. 
Um, we do have a number of programs that we focus specific control on through our staff or through partners. Leafy Spurge is not one of those species that we um, treat specifically in-house. It's in a category of species that we help provide landowners um, with the resources either through cost share or through grant programs through the state to meet their land management goals. We also focus pretty significantly on biocontrol for leafy spurge and uh, on research for, for different methods of control. And I guess, I guess what I mean by that is all the biocontrol agents that I had up there on Leafy Spurge have been extremely successful, um, but have been on the landscape for a long period of time. And there is some concern that we may have had two species of Leafy Spurge that are very, uh, very closely related, Euphorbia estula and Euphorbia brigata. And when um, the flea beetles in particular were introduced, I don't think there was a lot of focus on the time on the genetics and the impact that they would have on one species or another. And there is some concern that as flea beetles um, began to expand across the landscape, they were very successful in reducing the density and the vigor of Euphorbia estula and essentially released Bergata. And so we've been working with uh, Agricultural Research Service to do significant genetic work for our, for our leafy spurge populations across Montana, the Dakotas and Wyoming to figure out if we really do have more Vergata now than we have Estula, as well as going back through the research with our uh, foreign exploration partners to see if there are collections of any of those biocontrol agents that came off of Vergata populations in the native range. Um, so that process, like we're, we're just starting to get information back from uh, the genetics work that went into that. Um, since, since the introduction of a lot of those biocontrol agents, there's been a lot more work on the genetic side that has shown that um, biocontrol agents um, are much more loyal to a specific um, genotype of the target weed than the broader, um, the broader um, species as a whole. Um, and so, there, there is much more focus on ensuring that the biocontrol agents actually attack the genotype um, of the species in the area that we're targeting. Um, flowering rush would be another example of that where um, it's not an insect, it's a smut um, that is extremely effective at attacking a, particular, a couple particular genotypes of flowering rush that we have in the invaded range. And now we're going back and trying to find very specific populations of that um, fungus so we can introduce them there. So I guess that is a long answer for leafy spurge. But... I think um, maybe just due to the time, if you have any questions, Bryce has his information here. He'll probably be around for a little bit, but thank you all for coming. Thanks to Bryce. And